Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Kevin Cotter, and I'll take you to Panama World Youth Day for an interview with Bishop Kevin Rhodes and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight we have Kevin Cotter joining us, who's an author and executive director of The Amazing Parish. He's also written a new book called Called. It's about missionary discipleship, how you can be a missionary within your own parish. And Kevin's going to walk us through that. And we also now go to a video in Panama City with Father Mark interviewing Bishop Kevin Rhodes. Bishop Rose from uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, former rector of Mount St. Mary's. That's where I first met him. Basically, he passed me and got my degree. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, I was one of Father Mark's teachers, too. I taught him a course right. on priesthood. what? The priesthood. Yep. Yep. Yeah, he did very well, everybody, by the way. <laughs> I want to get your reflection as a bishop of one of these events. How do you think it helps the youth and maybe even the impact on the local culture that you can tell as a shepherd, you know? I always think yeah. that's kind of overlooked too. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, what gives me the greatest joy of World Youth Day is, is seeing the excitement of my own young people and how it's uh, affecting them and their faith, their relationship with God. We make sure that we, we make sure we have a lot of time where they, they can pray and reflect during the week. Uh, certainly having fun at all the events, but also that they can internalize the messages that we're hearing uh, from the Holy Father or from me or from others. Um, and then the experience of, of, uh, of them meeting young people from other countries. And, and you know, I really encourage them to, to go out and you know, talk to kids from other so, so they have a lot of fun you know, singing with them and all that. And they, they really under, get to understand and experience how big the church is, you know, how, how diverse, how universal it is. So really my, my biggest joy is, is watching them. Yeah. Watching them um, and seeing their excitement. Have you been able, are you part of the catechesis to teach? I'm not this, not this wrong. I have been in the past. I wasn't Sydney, but there's only a uh, few bishops who I guess, U.S. bishops who were chosen to give catechesis. So it was kind of nice to do everything. Although I've, <laughs> I've had to, uh, I've, I've of course had hobbies yeah. for my own diocese. Which is okay. I think that's such a great element too. I was in Toronto for a and went to some of those, and it's just powerful having I mean, a bishop teach. Did you experience that as a bishop? Yeah, yeah my first time going to work with them, I was already a bishop. I was sick, but I've been a few since then. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just great to see the bishop, uh, the bishop's teaching and, you know, bringing the gospel uh, to the young people. Um, when we had that U.S. gathering, the English-speaking gathering, I was with our kids and we listened to Bishop Caggiano and Bishop Burns. And it was just neat to, to see them as bishops, brother bishops, uh, preaching the gospel and sharing some of their stories with the young people. I find that when I talk to them, they are so curious about our own faith and our own vocation. Um, so I find that's a part of what we think too, where we get to just share our story about our being disciples of Jesus. Um, yes, yeah, shepherds and teachers, but prior to that, we're also disciples. Uh, and they get, um, I find young people really, really interesting. How about the Marian theme? That was really exciting to me this year. Uh, Mary of Antigua. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think the, the, it's wonderful to use the um, Mary's response of the Annunciation as the theme because it's so deep. I am the handmaid of the Lord, I'm the servant of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. Um, we can reflect on that in all different ways, the whole theme of vocation, the whole theme of Mary accompanying us and helping us uh, to, um, to follow her son. Uh, it's, there's something very warm about this, having this Mary and theme. Mary's a kind of witness on this pilgrimage. We've been singing that Spanish song, Santa Maria del Camino, that, that we really feel the Blessed Mother's by our side as we uh, participate in the Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thanks, Father. Can we get some blessing? Sure. Can we get the bishop? Oh, 
Thanks, Mori WTN. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hey, yeah, I'll be glad to give you a blessing. Oh, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Kevin, welcome to Life on the Rock. Great to be here. Thanks so thank much you. for having me. Well, thank you. And uh, you've written a new book called Called about missionary discipleship. Yeah. And um, what, what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, you know, the book is all about our call as Catholics to evangelize. You know, mm -hmm. so much in the last few years, our, our Holy Fathers have really emphasized this idea that by our baptism, each Catholic, every single Catholic who's been baptized, is called to evangelize. evangelize. And uh, it's such an amazing call. It's so great yeah. that we have this. But so many times people say, all right, I, I know I'm supposed to be called. I know what that idea looks like, but I don't actually know how to do it. And what the book does is walks people through five weeks, really step-by-step -step process for how can I learn how to evangelize? And so this ideal could actually be put into practice. Right. And actually, before you got into focus, what brought you to Christ in your mm. own life? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, uh, I had an amazing upbringing just with my parents just okay. in the Catholic faith. And so uh, Catholic grade school, mass yeah. on Sundays, my parents just set a really amazing example. But it was really around junior high, high school where all those big questions start yep. to come in, social pressures, and you're trying to start to wonder about life. You're starting to figure things out. And that's when um, some great Protestant brothers and sisters just mm -hmm. were in my life and they really just announced the gospel in a very clear way. And for the first time, I think I really understood, and I think it hit me at that particular age of who Jesus was and what he did on the cross for me. Right. And just that really clear call to give my life over to him. Um, and that just changed my life completely. And so it's able to give my life to him. Uh, I always remained Catholic, uh, but uh, had a lot of friends right. who were Protestant. I always had that kind of, huh, should I be Protestant? Should yeah. I be Catholic? And it was just through a There's lot of- There's a lot of that, yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, of great Catholic friends helped yeah. me see the truth and saw live, live the Catholic faith out in an amazing way and was able to live my Catholic faith and continue to do so. Right. And yeah. you know, actually during those times, we often don't think about it, but that going through high school, college, mm -hmm. there is a lot of, you know, things that throw up are an obstacle to the faith. Yeah. And you know, sometimes we do have to encounter people to build up our faith. Yeah. Can you talk about that in your book, the encounter part. Can you speak on that? Yeah, you know, I think um, one of the biggest things that stops people from evangelizing is they actually haven't encountered Jesus Christ right. in this church, right? Like we can't right. give what we don't have. Right. And so it's so important that we encounter Jesus Christ. I'm like a robot. <laughs> What's that? A robot with no feelings yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, but when we encounter him, yeah. we actually accept him in our lives. And, and, and that happens in so many different ways. For some people, it's during adoration. And they, for the mm -hmm. first time, go, oh. oh my gosh, Jesus Christ is real yeah. and he loves me. For other people, like we've talked about before, it's a, a friendship. And that person just out of love says, this is why I live the way I do. Yeah. This is why I think the way I think. And I want to invite you in to a relationship with Jesus in this church because it's so important. Yeah. That encounter can happen in so many different ways, and it's an ongoing encounter. It's through prayer each day. It's through the sacraments. Yeah. It's through friendships and community that we understand who Jesus is, and we say, oh my gosh, if, that's, if Jesus is who he says he is, if God is who he says he is, how do I not share with, that, right. uh, with other people? Because it completely changes your life, yeah. and you go, oh my gosh, I want other people to hear that. And prayer is so key to encountering Christ, because mm. you can't encounter Christ without prayer. That's, that yeah. is so key into it. And that prayer can be expressed in all kinds of ways, but that is a, just very fundamental. Absolutely. And also just being a disciple. How do we be a disciple to others? Yeah, that's just, I, I love that question yeah. because discipleship, often we hear that, we're like, oh, I'm supposed to follow Jesus. But I really try to emphasize in the book is what did discipleship mean in the ancient world? When Jesus is a mm -hmm. teacher in, you know, in, in Judaism, and he's calling uh, his disciples to follow him. What, what does that actually yeah, mean? Because we just yeah. take it for granted. We just yeah. hear the gospel so often. We're just that, supposed to get it kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. and like yeah. We, don't, we don't get the context. And in Jesus' day, they had a whole system of teachers, often called rabbis, who would go around and teach, um, you know, really teach about mm -hmm. the scripture, the thing that was the most important. That was the most valuable job in their entire culture. So when Jesus, as a rabbi, as he's often called in the gospels, goes and he's calling his disciples to follow him, what Jesus is actually doing is saying, it's not just saying, come and follow me or come and hang out with me. He's saying, I want you to live with me. I want you to learn to be like me. Right. And so this is a huge call right. for someone who's a fisherman to all of a sudden say, right. you're a rabbi and you can teach scripture. You have the most esteemed right. position in all of Judaism. That's an amazing call to be yeah. 
Jesus' disciple. Well, I like so, how your book puts it. It's yeah. like getting a scholarship. <laughs> yeah. Know, it's like a free education. It's, kind yeah, of thing. it's like a scholarship. Yeah. Imagine if you're a fisherman and somebody says you have a, you know, a scholarship to mm -hmm. Princeton. I mean, this is the type of call that Jesus is giving his disciples. And um, so that's why they drop their nets. Yeah. Well, that's why they say, oh, my, you know, my dad and his business, I'm going to yeah. follow after this rabbi because he believes that one day that I could be a rabbi just like right. him. Yeah. That's actually a very intimate thing that Christ would look at that and trust that to us, mm -hmm. that we could be used as, you know, his instruments to proclaim the gospel. That's very powerful. So he sees a vision in us. So can you yeah. talk about that vision? Well, I think, yeah, that's, that's an amazing thing because he, he says, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this call to make disciples of all nations, and that's who we are today, mm -hmm. these disciples of all nations who are supposed to learn how to be like Jesus, which is just really frightening in some sense. Right. Like, oh my gosh, how can I be like Jesus? But it's so important that we pursue that. And then the fullness of that, just like Jesus had disciples mm -hmm. and he was calling people to follow after him, we know that as disciples of him, we're called to have other people come right alongside of us and live next to us and learn how to be like us and through us be like mm -hmm. Jesus. You know, just like St. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Right. And so just like St. Paul, we're, we're supposed to be in other people's lives and saying, hey, I don't know, I know I don't have it all together, right. but I'm following after Jesus. And right. through our relationship, you can learn how to yeah, follow He's him the one well. that transforms us into his image he, through his grace. We're brought to his life, you yeah. know. And a lot of times I think we can be discouraged because, you know, we think, well, God's standard is way up here and I'm way down here. Mm. How do I even get up there? Yeah. How does God equip us, you know, in building us up? How does he do that? Yeah, you know, I think that well, one thing that brought to mind an example in the book is, mm -hmm. you know, Jesus calls Peter to walk on the water. Like, this right. is this crazy thing that Jesus is walking on the water, and Peter, because he's a disciple, yeah. he goes, I'm supposed to be like you. So if you can walk on water, what does that mean as a right. disciple? That means I can walk on water. And Peter's right. like, okay, like, let's do this. And, and, and Jesus says, come. Like, come. Jesus doesn't say, hey, Peter, that's a bad idea. Or Peter, you're, you're a moron. Like, you can't be like me. <laughs> like, Jesus yeah. actually says, no, you can do it. Right. I believe in you. And so Peter actually takes a step out of the boat, starts to fall after, Je after Jesus, but he gets afraid, right? right? And right. he starts to sink. And I think that's what happens to us so many times yeah. is as we're trying to follow Jesus, we're starting to believe, oh, I, I think I can actually be like Jesus through right. the sacraments, through prayer. We start to have this fear. And that's where I think a lot of our attachments in life, a lot of our sins catch up to us. And so I think it's really learning to have that daily encounter right. in prayer we can allow the Lord to work on us and allow the Lord to really be in that school of prayer to learn to be like yeah. Jesus and overcome those stumbling and blocks. And one of the stories I liked in, in the book was the little girl playing the piano in the parlor. Yeah. And uh, there was a man who was listening and she, I guess she was just plunking around and a gentleman came up next to her mm. and started playing chords and they started making music and what was kind of irritating to him now started to sound like music. And in a way, God's grace, that's what he works through our life, that we're not perfect, yeah. but he, he makes us perfect. Yeah, so it's such, a, such a beautiful yeah. image, a beautiful story of this little girl playing and banging on the yeah. piano, just really discord and like right. ugly. Yeah. But her father, who's actually a composer, can take that discord and make something beautiful. Right. And, and the same thing with our lives, as you pointed out, is just the mess that we bring, the sins that we have, mm -hmm. the attachments. But as we're running after our Lord, he makes something beautiful. He does something beautiful through St. Peter, who falls in the water, who denies right. him so many times, then who's our first pope and is able to really lead the church and really bring about just an amazing amount of disciples himself. That's what the Lord wants to do with us. Right. And so we can't be afraid of the times we mess up. We can't be afraid of our faults and failings. We know Jesus wants us to do something amazing with us, and he's going right. to do that because yes. he's the master composer that can pull right. it off. Well, all right, well, hold that thought, and we'll come back to Called right after this break. Kevin, can you talk to us a little about, a bit about disciple making? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably one of the most intimidating things. We were right. talking a little bit before of, you know, all of a sudden I'm going to follow after Jesus and call other people to follow me. And so I think as we kind of go along this journey, even walking through the steps from the book, mm -hmm. as we encounter Jesus and then we follow him, right. then we have a vision for, okay, I need to actually share this. I've been given this amazing encounter. I've had this experience in prayer and through the sacraments and following him, and now I need to share him. 
But that ultimately isn't enough Mm because Jesus calls us to go out and make disciples of all nations. And in doing so, we're called to raise people up. So as we present the gospel to them, then we're going to help them follow after Jesus and then help them learn how to share their faith with others as well. It really doesn't end until we get to that point because mature Christians, again, that's what we're called to through our baptism is to share our faith. And so a lot of times we can be settle. We're like, oh, someone's had a conversion or they've gone through RSA, which is so good, but really haven't reached maturity they're not really had that adulthood, that mature right. faith until they're actually able to share that with others. And a lot of times the best way to do that is through discipleship. Again, yeah. if people say, boy, I don't know how to do this. Just like Jesus called disciples to live with yeah. him and be around him. Very much a one-on-one encounter. Yeah. Because we all need help. We all need guidance, especially totally. that. And even in the, in, in the beginning of this book, you talk about there's a mentorship. Mm-hmm. And Father Mike Spitz, uh, Schmitz in his um, uh, introduction or preface, and uh, I thought that was so important because we do need that one-on-one encounter. We do need somebody there to guide us that we're not to do it on our own. Yeah. You know, ultimately, the guidance comes from God, but God uses a lot of instruments to help lead us to himself. Because one of the number one objections, I think, is oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not holy enough. Yep. There's a lot of I'm just not good. <laughs> yeah. So, and, uh, but we can always overcome that through so many different means, the sacrament, spiritual direction. Yeah. And, uh, but one of the things you talk about is a win, build, sin model. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, this is something that um, has been used by our Protestant brothers and sisters. It's something mm-hmm. that we used a lot when I was working for Focus, and they still use that today. But it's really helping people see uh, the connection between coming to faith and then sharing the faith as well. Right. So this, the idea is ultimately that we, you know, first off, we need to have that encounter. We need to be won over yeah. to the faith. Just because we've been even baptized Catholic, at a certain point in time, we come alive in the faith mm-hmm. and we live it out. And so we really need to have that win in our lives yeah. where we plant the flag and we say, Jesus, I'm all yours. I yeah. believe in you and I believe in your church and I want to live that out. Yeah. Um, but of course, that's not enough. We need to be built up the faith. A lot of things we've been talking about with prayer and sacraments and spiritual direction. All of a sudden, I learned how to follow Jesus. I haven't just made that initial commitment, but yeah. that depth starts to really come in. But we really, we don't want to just have this kind of Catholic hot tub experience where we just, hey, we're hanging out, it's (laughs) great, this is really good, I have the prayer, I have sacraments. We're called to share our faith. And if we're not doing that, we're like I said before, we're not coming to that matureness There's some work involved. Yeah. And that may be in your prayer life, that may be in your studies, too. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. You know, to reach now, because there's that element of having to get out of your own comfort zone. Totally. You know, and there's a lot of that. Yeah. uh, But that's so key, that's so critical. That's what Christ calls us to do, you know, to go to... You know, the peripheries of the world. Yeah. Just to, you know, it could be our neighbor, it could be somebody down the road, it, it could be anybody. Yeah. And that we are called to go out there and I don't know, many times just meet people where they're at, mm-hmm. you know, and that's you know, whether it's at work, at school. And um, so I know there in college being a focus, you know, you would have probably encountered a lot of that. So, yeah. but did you ever kind of encounter any resistance? towards that and how did you deal with that? Yeah, you know, I think there's always, you know, no matter who you're talking with, whether it's someone who doesn't know the Christian faith at all, someone who is Christian or someone who's Catholic, I think there's just, I think in all of us there's this resistance in us, you know, to actually um, take that deeper encounter Mm -hmm. or to follow after Jesus more or to actually um, be be sent and go off and and share our faith as well. And I think um, for me, I, I try to do less of what I can do in that person's right. life and give them Jesus. Right. I just say, what do you think the Lord wants? Well, sometimes there's that fear of failure. Totally. That, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm trying, but nothing's happening. Yep. So, you know, we can be certainly discouraged by that, but we're not called to be discouraged. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times, you know, maybe our calling is to, you know, offer prayer or sacrifice, you know, just for the conversion mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever situation or circumstance a person may be yep. a beginner. And so that's very key. And that's yeah. all being part of a disciple. Absolutely. So, yeah. And I think just trying to identify, help people identify what is that fear? Like name it, yeah. claim it. Like what yeah. is stopping you and figure out why yeah. that is. And even in those moments, again, we're talking about encounter and re-encounter, yeah. we can give our lives over to the Lord, but there's things that come up, whether they're sins or attachments or fears. Yeah. And all of a sudden in that moment, we need to say, what do I believe more yeah. in at this point? Do I believe more in Jesus yeah. Or do I believe in more in the center yeah. attachment? We have to make that choice. And I love how you put it in your book, especially in times of prayer. It's a lot, mm. what's holding us back? Yeah. What is that thing? Maybe it's one, maybe it's two, maybe it's many. But yeah. bring it to prayer. And a lot of times God will reveal that in our yeah. lives. And so I think that is so. Um, Krishna, I want to ask you, what is Amazing Parish? What is that? Yeah, so executive of the Amazing Parish. Okay. Amazing Parish is all about transforming 
parishes. We do that mm -hmm. by empowering pastors to really build a leadership team around themselves in a parish. We all know, uh, you know, we have less and less priests these days, and many times right. our priests are uh, really isolated. They can be mm -hmm. alone. Uh, oftentimes they just have one priest at a parish, or, or many times a priest is overseeing multiple parishes. Right. Yeah. And that'd be really difficult because one person trying to lead all those different things yeah. can really be uh, difficult, it can be time consuming, and lead to a lot of fatigue. They can be far away from each other. <laughs> Absolutely, too, yeah. yeah. So what we try to do is really give him a leadership team around him so that he can then have enough people and, and really a, a team of people who can lead his parish, not just to maintain what's going on in that parish, but really lead them into mission as well. So that's, right. you know, the book's all about personal evangelization. I know in my own experience, really trying to evangelize at my parish, a lot yeah. of times if that structure wasn't in place, if there wasn't yeah. a good leadership team, the, the parish staff, the priest would look at me and go, I mean, we'd like to, but we're so overwhelmed just trying to maintain everything right. in this parish. We can't really go on mission. But that's not what our parishes are called for. They're really called to help you know, Christians, help Catholics yeah. live out their calling to be evangelists. They're supposed to be, as Pope Francis calls, missionary centers. And so giving them that team, giving them that spiritual and uh, organizational health as a team to be leaders in their parish can help their parishes yeah. actually go on mission. And it's also good just to invite, you know, if somebody's about going to Mass or something, to yeah. encourage them and to go back and, you know, and if to go with them, you know, or, or bring them there, you yeah. know. And uh, I do think, yeah, it is so important because, you know, even in the parish, we all, even in the religious life, you got to be evangelized sometimes mm -hmm. numerous times, an ongoing conversion, Yeah. you know, and sometimes we do need that spark, that renewal, or if it's mm -hmm. just an invite to a retreat, that's so, I know many times in my life, retreats have always kind of mm. reunited that flame, yeah. you know, and that love of Christ, so yeah. that's, that's great work. Well, Kevin, you have written a great book, and um, I wish we could talk a little bit more <laughs> about it, but we've run out of time. But I thank you for being here on Life on the Rock. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, great to be here. Well, Kevin certainly has a lot of wisdom and experience to share with us. Yeah. And one of the things that really spoke to me during his interview was how engaged he is in discipleship. Mm -hmm. That he's, you know, authoring a book, he's written several, but also as an executive director working in the parishes and really kind of strengthening and getting people involved. And that's so important that we do get involved with our faith. Not just kind of sit back and be idle and let others kind of just do the work for us, but actually take, you know, that initiative and go in there yeah. and, you know, to revive that spiritual life and so much around, revolves around our prayers, our studies, our activity, and so forth. And I think Kevin, he really does lay a good example in the book of how we can do that. So. And so the same thing with Bishop Rhodes at uh, World Youth Day. I've been to several World Youth Days and just being able to see mm -hmm. bishops teach. Right. You know, Father Mark was asking Bishop uh, Rhodes what it was like for him to teach as a bishop. Yeah. And he got to see Bishop Caggiano and Bishop Burns actually teach. Yeah. And that's what the bishop's role really is as chief shepherd is Teaching. to teach. And it's so important today whenever there's so much confusion. Yeah. And we need that discipleship. We need clarity. We need clarity. Yeah. And to, you know, to sort out all that. And that's a good way to get into our faith, start studying it, you know, and bringing it to others. So I think that is one way we can be a disciple out of many yeah. So, what does that go into the Vineyard Challenge? Well, this week? our into the Vineyard Challenge today is take initiative, take initiative like Kevin Cotter, who's going out, writing books, building up parishes, and evangelizing, because we're all called to be disciples, and that's something we need to be reminded of constantly. So. Just don't be the one to sit back on the sidelines yeah. and to think that oh, somebody else will do it. You take the initiative. Right. You want to start a book study, or a Bible study, or something in the parish. You can take the initiative. And God calls us, and He's going to give us that grace to do His work. So. May the blessing of Almighty God be upon you this day, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. See you next time on Life on the Rock.